happy Friday and match day, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, lots to talk about this week, but first I want to say I've spent this whole year trying not to be political, but I can't take it anymore. I mean, the Biden administration has gone one step too far. First of all, they announced their July 4th Freedom Plan. Well, wait a minute. Dr. McDivitt did that a month ago. Where was the shout out to Baylor College of Medicine? Oh, and by the way, the new plan is to uh, license vaccines to India to provide them worldwide. Dr. Hotez has been then doing that for six months. We didn't get a single shout out, but not to be outdone. Uh, I noticed that the Republicans are doing their best uh, efforts. Uh, polls show that uh, 20% of Republicans will not get vaccinated and 30% of them are reluctant to do so. So between the two sides of it, I don't know. I'm, it's tough to be an American these days, but that's okay. We got a lot of data to look through, uh, a lot of updates on COVID. This time I thought we'd talk a little bit about variants and because it's topical, maybe some of the vaccine reluctance information. Uh, first of all, uh, case numbers across the country are dropping, so that's, that's good. They're not going as fast as we'd like them. Uh, that's beginning to slow down. That's probably because of some of the emergence of variants. The other good news is almost 30% of the population has received at least one dose of a vaccine. So that's, that's actually great. And when you compare that to Europe, Europe is a mess. So, you know, I have been saying for a long time, you know, U.S. is leading in deaths and morbidity, mortality. Europe is coming to the fore. They, they're trying to screw it up worse than us. So they, they're not getting their acts together around the vaccine. And now they got a big issue around AstraZeneca, which we'll talk about in a little bit uh, later. In the U.S., though, no city is doing worse than my sister's hometown, New York City. You know, they were doing so great. Well, not so much anymore. They had almost 3,500 cases just uh, the other day, so that's not very good. And the Northeast in general isn't doing so well, and I don't know if it's a weather-related thing or what, but um, maybe it's part of the New York variant as well. So there's some interesting modeling to sort of predict what's going to happen. Uh, as you know, we sort of follow the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME, that comes out of Washington. And the interesting thing about this is this really clearly shows uh, the big spike that Europe had. Europe had a giant spike. It's beginning to plateau now, but that spike was almost certainly uh, the presence of the United, the United Kingdom, the UK variant. In the United States, we have a different situation. The projections have been if we just follow what we're doing and continue to get vaccinated, we'll see a slow decline. My concern and the big issue that we've been talking about for the last several weeks is if we stop doing what we should be doing around public health or the variants become a problem, you can see that the modeling projects that we will be with a lot of cases for a lot longer than we want. And for those of us who originally came up with the idea around July 4th, uh, we would be very upset because we would like really to think that we could achieve uh, almost normal behavior by the middle of the summer. So what I was talking about, if you look at the cases in the United States, you know, it was dropping really fast, but if you look right down here, it's beginning to slow. And if you look at Texas in particular, and this is what I'm a little concerned about, not only is it slowing the last couple of weeks, but it's beginning to look like it might be ticking up a little. Uh, that begins to follow that model that the IHME had of us having a long period of sustained numbers of cases, which is not good. Now, we could get rid of all that if we spent more time focusing on wearing masks and physical distancing, but that's an issue. It's, it, it's, that's the big concern, of course, uh, as we loosen up if we don't really uh, practice good public health measures. And frankly, for the last couple of uh, days, our, our number is now back over one. Remember, over one means the virus is winning. And we've been over one now for three days in a row. Uh, the good news on, the, on the, uh, the positivity rate is we're still around 5%. But we have about 1,000 new cases a day. And that's just not where we need to be. We need to be <laughs> under 200, under 50. And we're having 1,000 new cases. And you can really see the plateau very obviously if you look at the uh, weekly average. And so we had this nice drop, and then for the last four weeks we've really been flat. And this will just continue to go on until we reach herd immunity through vaccinations or through everyone getting sick. 
or if we just focus on public health measures a little bit longer, just another month or two. The, the same is true of our hospitalization numbers. Our hospitalization numbers have begun to flatten. The good news, though, is we're almost up to 1 million vaccinations, up to at least one dose of vaccinations. So we're doing a good job in, in Houston now with vaccines. We had the FEMA site open up, the large site uh, over at the stadium. And so, we're, you know, the, between the city, the county, and the hospital systems, I think we're, we're really uh, doing a better job at vaccination. We need to keep ramping that up because it's pretty clear we're not good at following public health measures. So it's, it's just a race. It's whether or not we can get enough people vaccinated before the variants take over. Now let's talk a little bit about the variants. A lot of people have been wondering, are the variants actually more virulent? In other words, do they make you sicker or is it just more infectious? Well, there's some evidence now emerging that they do actually make you sicker, at least the United Kingdom variant. So that's the... Uh, uh, the one, the B.1.1.7, as it's known, but it's the UK variant, first described in the United Kingdom. So there was a paper last week that came out in the British Medical Journal that looked at 100,000 participants uh, from October in 2020 through January of this year. And they looked at 367 deaths. And what they found when they looked back on the virus uh, 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 genealogy was that 227 deaths were associated with the new variant and only 141 with the previous variant. So that was the first data that suggested there might be an increase in virulence. And I, I mentioned that a couple, I think last week. Uh, now there's another paper that just came out this week in Nature that looked at over 2 million matched patients and 17,000 deaths. Uh, and basically it's, it shows that there's an increase uh, in fatality and it raises the case fatality rate from about 0.6%. Remember, I'm always talking about about 0.5%. Well, they came up with 0.6%, but if you have the UK variant, it's 0.9%. So, you know, that, that leads to hundreds, thousands more people dying from the variant. So it is a big issue. So the, the emergence of these variants is a problem. Uh, hopefully it won't get to the point that it's a, a problem for us because we have, we've had some time in advance of these variants, but they're beginning to emerge in Houston. And if you look at the, the UK variant in particular, it's getting to be pretty prevalent. You can see particularly in Florida and California uh, and in Michigan, uh, it's, it's really, really growing. Uh, and and there have been over 5,000 cases uh, reported, but remember that's way underestimating because that's just the number that can actually uh, do the diagnosis. In our own local in, in Houston, it looks like it's almost 40% uh, of, of the viruses now are the UK variant. So we really are in a race, uh, as we mentioned all the time, to get enough people vaccinated because the vaccine is effective in treating the UK variant. Uh, we also have the South African and the Brazilian variant in town. You know, we're an international city. We welcome all newcomers. Uh, we, were, we have the New York variant, the California variant, any, any variant around the world, you can pretty much end up in Texas and probably in Houston. So that's why we all have to get vaccinated. So, you know, let's, let's start talking about vaccines and why they're important. You know, the CDC right now is estimating that almost half the transmissions are from asymptomatic people. So we can't diagnose everybody, and if everyone was symptomatic, it, it'll be a little, little easier. But if everyone's not symptomatic, or half the people are not symptomatic, you have to vaccinate everybody to get rid of those asymptomatic spreaders. Uh, and we now know that the vaccination reduces the chance of infecting others. So we've, there have been some studies looking at the amount of viral load, you know, the amount of viruses being produced by individuals. And they are four to five fold reduced even within the first uh, few weeks of getting the first vaccination. And that means your ability to transmit virus is much lower. The transmission is based on the number of viruses you're spewing out. And if they're fivefold reduced, uh, it, it, it reduces the viral burden significantly. Uh, you remember we talked about masks reducing it by five to tenfold. So it's, it's almost like having a mask on everybody. Uh, the other thing is we are nowhere near herd immunity. We've been talking about herd immunity. We have a couple of different prevalence studies, that is, how many people have been infected that they don't really know it or do know it, but uh, we do that through with antibody tests so we know whether you've been exposed or whether you know it or not, we can tell. And right now it's about 30% of the population of Houston. So if we're gonna get to 65% and we have 7 million in the greater Houston area, we've got millions of people that need to get vaccinated for us to achieve uh, herd immunity. 
Uh, just a couple of you know observations now. Uh, there have been 280 million people vaccinated with Moderna, Pfizer, and the J&J &J vaccine. There have been zero deaths attributed to that. Now, I want that to sink in when you start weighing, should I get vaccinated? Let's see, there are 500,000 people who have died in the United States, and there's been zero deaths with 2.8 million or 280 million vaccinations. I mean, really, it, this is like the original no-brainer. Uh, you know, and for those who are worried about their kids, well, the CDC has reported now over 2,000 kids with this multi-system inflammatory syndrome. It's very severe disease. Many of the kids have neurologic consequences, heart disease. It's not a lot. It's only a few thousand. But it's a few thousand, you know, compared to zero. So luckily, the vaccination studies are going to start including uh, uh, kids, and we'll start having those answers soon. Hopefully, I'll give you an update on that. Uh, soon. And if you look at unvaccinated individuals, they're 44 more times more likely to develop symptomatic COVID and 30 more times more likely to die from COVID than if they weren't vaccinated. So it seems like vaccines have been like a real benefit in this particular disease. So of course, <laughs> there's on the news every night AstraZeneca. So what's going on with the AstraZeneca vaccine? And this is a, this is a huge issue for Europe. Uh, so remember, AstraZeneca was uh, developed in collaboration with the University of Oxford, and it's a chimpanzee adenoviral vector. So we, the one we get uh, from J&J &J is an, a, an adenovirus, a human adenovirus from a, a rare type, adeno26. This is a chimpanzee adenovirus, uh, and there have been two billion doses pre-ordered for Europe. So you know they were really counting very heavily. This is almost kind of the European uh, vaccine. And so far what's happened is it's now been uh, suspended in many of the European cities. There were four serious cases reported in Norway of healthcare workers that had some sort of clotting disorder and two patients died from brain hemorrhages. Now, again, I want to put that in perspective. There have been almost 10 million doses given in Europe and in England. And there are four reports, and they're not necessarily linked to this, but there have been four reports. But because of those four reports, Norway, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Denmark, uh, Iceland, and Romania have all stopped uh, using uh, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. It is true that platelet counts, uh, that's the thing that causes your blood to clot. They drop a little bit lower in, with this particular vaccine than with others, but not to the point where you'd expect some uh, problem to happen. And there have been similar cases uh, in the United States with other vaccines. So it's not all that clear they're linked. Uh, and if you think about the European goal to vaccinate 70% of its population, they're not going to get there. They're not going to get there in the fall. And remember, we all, Americans, want to return to normal. And part of returning to normal is we want to go to Europe. We want to go visit. I want to go to Italy. You know, I want to go back to Paris. You know, we can't do that if people aren't getting vaccinated and they will close their borders to people. So uh, we want them to be vaccinated and successfully. So the European Medical Authority, which is like the FDA uh, in Europe, says it, it's investigating these outbreaks. There's been a huge emotional reaction to this AstraZeneca, this issue. Uh, and it's not clear that they're even related. Uh, there's it's not even clear that there's a higher incidence in the normal of these kinds of events. So, uh, so far, the entire number of cases uh, that have been reported with any thromboembolic complication, that it's a uh, clotting or embolic uh, problem, is, is a total of 30 cases in 5 million people. So even, it's not clear that it's related, but even if it were, it, it still might get approved. So, so we don't know. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what they do in Europe. But it would be, really be a shame if, they're counting on AstraZeneca and it, it can't be used, but I, I don't know, I, I can't call that one. My guess is the European authorities will agree that it's, a, it's safe to use, but that people will stop using it because of emotional reasons. So what about reluctance in the United States? Let's forget Europe, what about in the United States? So, you know, there's a pretty solid group of people who say they will definitely not be vaccinated, but it's, it's an ever shrinking number. Uh, in September, it was about 24%, and now it's down to 15%. Uh, and, and the ones that are sort of maybe folks are another 15%, but that number is shrinking. So right now, we think that 
if there's pretty good survey data that 70% of the population will get vaccinated for sure, that 15% are reluctant and 15% are never, you know, for my dead body, and maybe, by the way. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, we'll, see how, we'll see how that goes. I hope, I hope we do better. So who are these people based on surveys? Who are the reluctant folks? Well, they're more likely uh, to be rural residents. Uh, there's still problems in the black and Hispanic community. It tends to be a little bit more wary of the vaccine. Uh, <laughs> of course, as I mentioned, there's a lot of vaccine enthusiasm among Democrats uh, and not a lot of <laughs> among Republicans. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, you know, we got to call it on ourselves. Many essential workers, including some healthcare workers, are reluctant. And that's a real problem because people, there's good data that people will rely on their healthcare worker. And if we're reluctant, if there are reluctance among nurses and medical staff, that's a real problem. So that's something we as a, as a field have to really address. And those with lower income uh, and those without college degrees are more likely to say they don't have enough information to make a decision. So. We clearly have educational issues. We have cultural issues we have to establish. <laughs> Healthcare workers have to clean up our own acts to make sure we're 100% behind the vaccine. Uh, so lot, lots, to, lots to deal with. Now there's a, a couple of final things I want to leave you with. We've talked a lot about herd immunity, and, and I don't think people are thinking of it the right way. When you get to herd immunity, it's not like, okay, if throw your mask off, we're all better. What happens is we, we, we have this rapid period where everybody's getting infected, and every time a person's infected, they're, 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 that's one less person who's available to be infected. So it begins to slow and slow and slow. And when you reach herd immunity, it's the point at which there's resistance to infection that's based on immunity or people vaccination or people having had the disease. And it begins to go down by itself, slowly but surely. But there's still people available to be infected. And so just because we reach herd immunity doesn't mean the virus goes away. Uh, so we may just, just like the flu season, we may have this amongst our population for quite a long time. The only way for it to go away, to go away completely is if, like in certain countries in New Zealand, uh, or, or even like Wuhan now, there's none of this around. If you lock it down and no one's got it, it can go away. And Spanish flu went away in, in uh, 1920. But... Right now, if we get the herd immunity, we'll, at least we'll be doing better. We'll be able to see the decline of the virus independent of our public health measures, is what I'm saying. Uh, the other thing I mentioned already is we need the whole world to get vaccinated. So start thinking globally. We need every part of the globe to be vaccinated if we want to reduce the number of variants uh, uh, that are being produced that put us at risk. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, there's, uh, there's no accounting for stupidity. Uh, so, uh, I remember I said how great Duke was doing? Giant outbreak at Duke because of Rush. So put a bunch of fraternities out there, have drinking and get together, big outbreak. So once again, since I was making them, giving them as an example of doing the right thing, they, they really screwed that one up. So they're, they're dealing with that now and, uh, you know, as I say, the, so speaking on the, uh, of, of no accounting for stupidity, the bars having unmasking events on Washington Avenue. I mean, really? I mean, just how dumb can you be? So one of the things that I, I, I've been pushing was that we should, put, we should vaccinate teachers. I've said that a few, about a month ago. Well, luckily now teachers are being vaccinated. I think that's appropriate. And the other, the other group we should be vaccinating is kids on campus. All those college students that are spending around, when they show up on campus, vaccinate them. I think one of the things we should do is move that group up because the 20 to 40 year old, 20 to 30 year olds are really the ones spreading, the, spreading it around and it's terrible on campuses. You got a captive audience, you got a Johnson & Johnson one shot vaccine, I'd vaccinate all of them. And then the final thing I wanna say is vaccines do not cause autism, illiteracy, sterility, or infertility. Now I've gotten more people asking me or telling me, one of our, my good friends told me she has friends who are absolutely not gonna get the vaccine, and their daughters aren't because they're, they're fear of infertility. So what is with that? So I thought I'd just mention, uh, there was a an 11 minute video published in June of 2020 on the website of an ex-soccer professional and conspiracy theorist named David Ick. Uh, and that has been on social media flying around. And the title of it was Big Pharma Whistleblower, 97% of Corona vaccine recipients will become sterile, will become infertile. Uh, and that it was part of a theory that the corona vaccine is planned for population reduction. 
I mean, it's, it's hard to know what you can to say about that. Uh, this is the second time a similar post against GlaxoSmithKline uh, was published in 1989. So this, this crops up every now and then. The British uh, Fertility Society felt that they had to say there's absolutely no evidence and no theoretical reason that any of the vaccines can affect fertility of women or men. And that is absolutely true. So I have no idea why people believe this, but just because it's circulating around on, on uh, social media, please don't use social media as your source of all things scientific. It just, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and you'll, you know, you put your own families at risk by, by not getting vaccinated uh, when you could. Now, I want to finish today because uh, this week, today in particular, uh, was match, is match day. Uh, and match day is one of the most important days for any training physician. When you get your MD, you're, unfortunately, you're not that competent to practice medicine. You have to go do specialty training. And you do that in, uh, in an internal, in, internship and a residency. And so you have to match. Uh, and it's a really a big day, and I remember it like it was yesterday for me. You don't have any idea where you're going to end up. So it's very, it's very traumatic, you know. You could end up on one coast or another coast, who knows. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very important thing. Uh, and, of course, you know, we're all, I'm a proud father, too. I'm very nervous. And, you know, I'm, I'm worried. Lily's going to match, and we don't know where she's going to be. Uh, I was nervous about two things because she has her competency-based exam today to see if she's able to enter the match. And if she passes her test, then she'll be able to enter the match. But we're all really excited about where she'll be, but we're certainly hoping she matches not only in Houston, but here at Baylor College of Medicine. So we will, we will see whether she, she does. And then the other thing, of course, was this, week's, was this week was St. Patty's Day. What a great way to practice social distancing and responsible behavior. I mean, in the middle of a global pandemic, green beer on the streets, oh my god. Anyway, the last thing I want to leave you with was this. This was our 52nd video. No one's more tired of this than me. Uh, but uh, it, it's been a wonderful uh, year doing these. Uh, and, you know, what, what can I say? I, I, did, I did the best I could. And so I have only one thing to say. Clotman out. Just kidding. I'll see you next week. Are you ready? Okay, it's very important. You gotta get them all. Okay. Look at that! You're so in that great.